recently published, and I also want to bring in a very different perspective on who should be paid well and who creates job in this, jobs in this economy, the private equity investor and former Bain Capital partner Ed Conner, and he is the author of a newly published book as well, Unintended Consequences, Why Everything You About the Economy is Wrong. Ed, great to have you back as well, and I, if, I can, if I were to choose two of the most different opinions, I have them right here, <laughs> uh, sitting on the economy and, and, and what really inequal, income inequality really means. And uh, Professor, I want to start with you, though, because what I just read about the Bloomberg Market Survey and, and sort of the pay increasing in 2011, you say is a perfect example of what you write in this book, which is rent seeking, right? Companies that are uh, companies and, and, and managers and CEOs who are essentially redistributing wealth from the bottom half to the top. That's right. You know, the old theory of economics was that compensation was related to productivity contributions either to the firm or more importantly to society because those two were supposed to be aligned and we saw in the great recession that that was not true that CEOs walked off with mega bonuses when they had brought their own company let alone the global economy to the brink of ruin well you might even say that about MF Global uh, as another yeah. example and the numbers that you gave mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Citibank as, as, as an other example where there's this incongruity between compensation and contribution the real point is that over the last 30 years the top 1% the share of the national income that they get has doubled the top 0.1% their share of the national income has tripled mm -hmm. uh, if it were the case that the increases in the income at the top trickle down to everybody so everybody was better off that would be one thing but that's not where well, we, we haven't are. seen that we, in, in fact the people in the middle the median income uh, half above half below are today worse off adjusted for inflation than they were a decade and a half ago so all the benefits of the growth have gone to the people at the top with the majority of Americans most are worse off than they were a decade and a half ago. Ed? Well, you take a decade and a half ago, that's the peak of the internet boom, so everybody wants to take that data so they can go from peak to trough. Uh, so, no, if you go back, let me just make it clear, if you go back to a full-time uh, worker, uh, male worker, as an example, his income is today lower than it was in the late 60s. Hmm. Uh, almost uh, a half century of stagnation. So we're not talking about just one business cycle. So we're talking about a half century I think if you of, look more, of stagnation. Look, I think if you look more carefully at the data, um, it'll show you that median incomes have grown substantially, that they don't adjust for household size. So if people get divorced, it splits the it, income it, in half. And, it, it, and it, it, the, the, the they don't count the taxes. They don't count the non-taxable uh, uh, the non benefits. They don't adjust for demographics in the workforce where we've taken in 20 million immigrants who, who earn below the median wage. We put working mothers to work. I think when you really step back and look at it, it, it employment in the U.S. has grown 40 percent since the mid-1980s. It's grown 15 to 20 percent in Europe and Japan. Okay. We've made houses for 20 million, homes for 20 million immigrants who've educated their children. No one's done more for the we, working we, poor in the middle class. We've had some successes, but let's, let's be Big clear success. about, about what, uh, the pattern of our growth in the period before 1980 right. and after 1980. period before 1980, our national growth was higher than the period after 1980. The period before 1980, we had share growth. People at the bottom. And what was the difference? The difference was? We hadn't had deregulation. Okay. We, we hadn't uh, weakened the unions. Uh, we hadn't uh, uh, had this unbridled CEO pay. We uh, didn't have the excessive financialization, which, you know, as Paul Volcker pointed out, all this innovation was directed at circumventing the regulations to stabilize our economy mm -hmm. and, rather than value. You know, the people at the top are not the people who invented the transistor, the computer, the laser. They're the people who brought the financial products that brought the economy to the brink let's, of room. Let's just look at the date, parse the data correctly though. You have the 50s and 60s where the U.S. economy did grow quickly. They were capitalizing on mass marketed manufactured goods that weren't really available prior to that. You then go to the 70s and 80s, the, the uh, manufacturing oriented economy slowed to a crawl. The productivity slowed down. And then in the commercialization of the internet, the U.S. alone has increased its productivity. Europe and Japan are down at 
1.2, 1 1.3% a year, or 2%. Yes. So if you don't see that the, the innovation has become critically important to this economy relative to the economy in the but 1950s, you, know, but, you, know, you won't see that risk takers and innovators no, are really You, you have the to understand the source of the innovation, the Internet, you mentioned that. The basic research for the internet was done by government. It doesn't right. matter. It, it, what it, it matters is somebody still has to commercialize well, it. They have to take yes, enormous risks. That is very somebody true. Somebody has to raise the taxes to finance the basic research, the education. You get Solyndra and, and the all those things and those great, make, uh, makes, well, those I, great I, I, uh, I think venture I, I capital. I want to focus on one point, makes. though, in the professor's book, which I thought was quite interesting. You had given an example, right, of Mitt Romney. You said, look, uh, Mitt Romney made $21 million last year, it was mm -hmm. reported along those lines. And uh, you can't possibly, as an individual, spend $21 million. I mean, you could try, but on a you know year-to-year -year basis and, and continue, you couldn't possibly do that. So that consumption... Uh, it doesn't trickle down into the economy, whereas the professor says if you, you know, gave that $21 million and sure. split it by 500 people, uh, those 500 people would very likely end up spending most of that money I think in it's the a, economy. The data just let me try to show. explain how that gives rise to the instability in our economy that led to the Great Recession. So when you have that redistribution from the bottom to the top, that's been a, a mark of the U.S. economy in recent years, there's it insufficient man to keep the economy growing. The Fed compensated for that by creating a bubble. It was a temporary palliative. I, I, I just think the data doesn't and, and support this. Take that, real estate and, prices. And, they rose in Europe and in, in the U.S. And, the same. They were under a different monetary they, they were regime. So. They were having quality. <laughs> okay. Well, Professor, let me look. Okay, Ed, make your point again. We'll the idea that the Fed engineered an asset bubble, I think, is, is silly. The, the real estate prices in Europe and throughout the world grew as much in the rest of the world as they did in the United States. I don't think you can make the argument they're, they're, that our monetary policy and our subprime finance changed real estate prices in the U.S. Uh, you know, it's absolutely clear that there was inadequate regulation. The Financial Inquiry Commission pointed this out. We led to a subprime bubble. Mm -hmm. The breaking of the well, bubble there, is a major problem in the United States. I don't want to say it's the only thing. But it was a major problem. This is the major problem in the financial crisis. If I could just ask you to just hold your thought. We're, gonna, right. we're just going to take a quick commercial break. I want to just make sure you, you both get to finish your points uh, quickly. We'll be back with Ed Connor and with Joseph Stiglitz in just a few moments.